are we in the dispensation of the prophets and how will God guide us after that? Why did Jesus say, I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance in Matthew chapter 9, verse 13, when even the others were unrighteous? Our guests answer your questions, so stay here. I'm Crystal Lewis. And I'm Rebecca Fanai. Bible Help Desk starts now. Welcome to Bible Help Us. We hope you are keeping cool because summer is in full swing here. And as a Florida native myself, I am no stranger to the heat. I don't know about you, Rebecca, but it's been, we've been getting some extreme weather lately. Oh, I definitely agree. I was just in Utah this past weekend and that kind of heat that I experienced, it's, it's putting me out for two days now. Um, but you know, not just with the weather, I believe that our world, we're starting to see more and more extremes. And the Bible does tell us about this as well. Um, but I hope that as we continue to study the word of God, that we would be be ready to face these extreme conditions that the Bible t tells us ahead of time as well. Yeah. Amen. So if you have questions while you study the Bible, don't forget to send them in. Bible Help Desk is here to help. You can text us or call in with your questions at 833-BIBLE-HD or send it in via Facebook, Instagram, or our website, hopetv.org slash Bible Help Desk. Don't forget to leave us an email so we can contact you back. Now, Crystal, can you tell us who is joining us today? Yep. Joining us today, we have Dr. Jennifer Daly. Dr. Daly has PhD degrees in systematic theology and economics from Andrews and Cardiff University. She is passionate about pouring her gifts into people, praying, preaching, and teaching. Welcome back, Dr. Daly. Thank you so much for having me. Also joining us today is Pastor Josias Flores. Pastor Flores currently pastors in Boone in Banner Elk, located in the mountains of Western North Carolina. He has a passion for authentic connections in faith communities, as well as open conversations about faith and holistic well-being. Welcome back, Pastor Flores. Good to be here. Thank you for having me. Before we get started with our questions, we want to share a verse for you found in Lamentations 3, verses 22 to 23. And it says, the faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. We see in these verses, each day that you wake up, always remind yourself that God is the Lord of love and his mercies never cease, like we read in these verses. If you have some sin in your life that you feel God will not forgive, always remember that God's love and mercy are greater than any sin. And as God promised, he will forgive those who repent. So let's continue to stay connected to God. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we are very thankful for your word. We are thankful for who you are and for the reminders that we have, Lord. Be with us, Lord. Allow us to uh, move forward and allow us to move deeper into a relationship with you so that we can build a, co a connection with you, Lord God, in everything that we do. Allow us to continue to pray to you in everything that we do as well. Be with our viewers and our guests that's here and be with us that's here as well. We love you, Lord, and we pray you. Amen. Amen. So, Rebecca, what is our first question? Yes, for our first question, we received a voicemail, so let's listen. I would like to know if we are still living in the dispensation of the prophet, and when did this end, and how does God still guide his people after that dispensation? Thank you for sending in the question. Now, I want to go to you, Pastor Flores, first. So the question we have here is, are we in the dispensation time for the prophets? Or And also the second question they pose here is, how will God guide us after that? Uh, can you give us some insights from the Bible as well? It sounds like our viewer is talking about a theological idea often known as dispensationalism. And under this theological idea, is the notion that there are seven different periods of time of Earth's history known as dispensations where God deals with humanity in different ways. So when he mentions the dispensation of the prophets, if I'm understanding him correctly, he's referring to that fifth stage in that theological idea, also known as the dispensation of law, often th thought to end uh, with Jesus's coming, first coming. And so I want to actually go to some of Jesus' words to look at the way that Jesus himself viewed the law and the prophets, another word for the Old Testament, what is often believed to be the guideline for this dispensation of law. So let's go to 
the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass away from the law until all is accomplished. Interesting that Jesus here is not saying, yes, I am doing away with the law and the prophets. He says he came to fulfill. And now some people could say, well, doesn't fulfillment mean that it no longer applies? Well, listen to what verse 18 says. Until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter nor stroke shall pass away from the law. So here we get this sense that Jesus viewed the law not as something that was only temporary for humanity, but as long as there is an earth, the law would have a place. And he came as a, a continuation of that law. I also want to go to 1 John. John talks about this as well. This is after Jesus has died and resurrected and ascended. So let's go to 1 John and, uh, and let's see what he has to say about this. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Here, John is talking about how keeping the commandments is not something that is done away with, but it's, it's something that displays our love for God. So to say that, hey, the things that happened to the prophets, the, the law that the prophets had to live under no longer applies to us, is something that even the disciples of Jesus after his ascension did not believe. They believed they still had a, a place in keeping the commandments. Finally, I want to go to John 14, 16 and 17 to answer the second part of the question that our viewer posed. How then are we going to be led uh, in this time that we're in? And this is Jesus sharing uh, to his disciples. He says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. When Jesus was telling his disciples that he was going to go away and he was going to prepare a place for them earlier in John 14, he's telling them, don't worry, I'm going to pray to the Father and the Holy Spirit will come and he will be your guide. He will be the one who will provide the power and also the steps forward in the young Christian church and beyond. So today we can trust that the Holy Spirit is still guiding God's church, just like Jesus promised, because it's something that Jesus said would happen, not only for his first disciples, but all the other disciples to come. Thank you so much, Pastor Flores, for answering that. Um, Dr. Daly, I want to pass the question to you as well. Do you have any other insights that you'd like to add as well? Yes, thank you, Rebecca. Uh, because dispensationalists think that God organizes history, the, the affairs of human history, according to these dispensations, these periods of special uh, organization, they actually also interpret the Bible in a similar way, as Pastor Susan Flores has, has said. So they think that parts of the Bible that apply to one dispensation are not applicable in general, because not all dispensationalists believe precisely the same thing. And that's what part of what makes it difficult. But in general, they believe that that part of the Bible would not apply to another dispensation. And so be because of that, the question is saying, if we're, if, we're, if we're out of the dispensation of the prophets, which I, I gather Pastor Flores is saying we're not, then we would need another way for God to communicate his guidance to us. And of course, we have heard that the Holy Spirit, as, we've, as we see in John 16, that the Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth, as Jesus says, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, that he will speak. The other thing that we should bear in mind, I think, when we consider whether this is so or, or how this inf uh, is, is influenced by what the Bible says, is that the Bible says in 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 to 17, that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God, the person, the Christian, the righteous man, the person who believes may be complete, thoroughly equipped 
for every good work. So in order for us to understand how God is guiding us at any period, it seems to me that that verse is saying that all of Scripture is necessary and that that is enough for us to understand God. In Luke 24, when Jesus was walking on the road to Emmaus shortly after his resurrection, the Bible tells us in verse 27 that beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And in Isaiah 28, verses 9 and 10, in that messianic passage, we're told, we're reminded that we, in order to understand really what the Bible is saying, we need to remember that we need to have precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little. So not only is all scripture necessary and is all scripture enough, but it's also scripture is enough to interpret itself. So that is important for us to understand how God is guiding us at any preachers, any point in time in history. So it's not that the Old Testament is no longer necessary in New Testament times. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 to 5, we see some sense of continuity from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Paul is talking to the Corinthians and he's saying, I don't want you to be unaware of what our fathers did in the past. In other words, the generations before us, they passed through the, on, under the cloud, they passed through the sea, they were baptized, they drank the same spiritual drink, and they followed the rock, which was Christ. He, he goes on to say their bodies are, strewn, are, are scattered across the wilderness. In other words, they are dead. But he said all the things that they did, they, those happened to teach us lessons. And in verse 11 of 1 Corinthians 11, we read that all these things happened to them as examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the age have come. So in John 16, when Jesus tells us that the Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth, what he goes on to say in the latter part of the verse is that the Holy Spirit will tell you things to come. In other words, the Holy Spirit teaches to different periods in history, both the present and the future. And it shows us there that the entire Bible, all of the Bible, is relevant to guiding us to understand what God's will is and how He wants us to live. Thank you so much, Dr. Daly, for um, painting that picture and kind of giving, uh, walking us through the timelines as well. And Pastor Flores, also want to thank you both for answering this question. And as always, if you have more questions about this topic, don't forget to continue sending in your questions. We are going to take a quick break, but first a reminder that Hope.Study has so many online studies to offer. So if you're looking for a way to keep your devotional time fresh and engaging, studies like The Secret to Finding Rest are just a few clicks away. Or if you prefer to receive a hard study guide, we also have free Bible study guides that we can mail to you in North America. Just call and leave us your address so that we can get those out to you. Also, if you have been blessed by our program or the study guides we offer, please consider making a monetary gift to Hope Channel. We need your support to keep blessing you and others. All right, it's time for us to take a quick break, but don't go anywhere because we have more fascinating Bible questions to explore when we come back. Welcome back to Bible Help Desk. Remember, you can call or text us your questions at 833-BIBLE-HD or find us on Facebook, Instagram, or our website at hopetv.org forward slash Bible Help Desk. Then watch to see if one of our guests answers your question. Our guests answering your questions today are Dr. Daly and Pastor Flores. Our next question comes to us via email from Claire. And the question is, why did Jesus say, I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance, which is found in Matthew 9, verse 13, when even the others weren't righteous? Dr. Daly, interesting question we received from Claire here. Can you provide some clarification of this verse here? What did Jesus mean? In, nine, in Matthew 9, verse 13. To appreciate that, let's look a little uh, back quickly at what preceded in verse 9. Reading from Matthew 9, verse 9, As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, Follow me. So he arose and followed him. Now it happened, as Jesus sat at the table in the house, that behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, 
Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? In Matthew 9, 12 to 13, Jesus was responding to that complaint by the Pharisees that he was socializing with tax collectors and sinners. Jesus said, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So Jesus was being a little bit facetious here in a way, a little bit sarcastic in a way, because the Pharisees were not righteous. The the question is correct. What he meant was, I think, how I wish that you would come and sit down with me also, as these others are doing, that you would realize that you are a sinner and you need to repent and accept my gift of salvation. Jesus knew that the Pharisees were more concerned about appearances than they were about realities. They were more concerned about how things looked to the eyes than than how they were lived in essence. They were more concerned about their cultures than than they were about true compassion. And so Jesus wishes that the Pharisees would realize the truth about themselves, that they are not righteous and that they need his help how transforming it would be for them and for their community if they were to experience that his love uh, if they would come and sit down at mm. his feet well thank you for dr daly for providing some clarification i understand some context in the bible some verses can need some additional clarification so thank you for that passive force is there anything else that you would like to add to this question here yes i first i am so grateful for the context What a good practice to have when studying the scriptures. It sounds like our viewer is also kind of taking from Romans chapter 3 in verse 10, where Paul writes, there is none righteous, not even one. And then verse 12, all have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. So I want to affirm that, yes, she's right. And as Dr. Daly said, No one is righteous, and the Pharisees in this situation are not righteous. But if you look at that context of that story, Jesus is talking about individuals who sense their need for him. These are the sinners, while the Pharisees and the lawyers or those who are studying the law, they think they have it all together. They think they're righteous. So he's speaking more to their self-perception rather than their spiritual condition. All are unrighteous, but they think they're righteous, and so they're not turning to Jesus. Jesus is saying, listen, those who understand that they need me, they're the ones that I came to talk to. And I would love to, as Dr. Daly beautifully put it, have you sit down on my feet and us have a conversation, but you're not willing because you think you're righteous. So I think the self-perception here is also something that Jesus is speaking to. Well, thank you for that, Pastor Flores, and providing that extra clarification as well to this verse. Thank you for sharing. Our next question, we received a text from Bessie, and the question reads, I currently work at a nursing home as a caretaker, but there are some Sabbaths that I have to work. Is going to work and helping people on the Sabbath bad? Mm -hmm. Now, I want to pass this to you, Pastor Flores. This is very fitting because I myself am a nurse, so there are definitely questions that we have to deal with this. Um, So what does the Bible tell us, or from your experience and what you have studied in the past as well, is going to work on the Sabbath a bad thing when you're helping people? Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you for your work as a nurse. And also thank you to our viewer for taking care of people. What an honorable profession. Uh, We were just talking about Jesus and also about the Pharisees and his interactions with the Pharisees and experts in the law. And I want to go back to another story in the Bible where Jesus is talking to these individuals in a different scenario. And this is found in Luke chapter 14. And in the beginning of this story, we find that Jesus goes into one of their houses And a man with dropsy on the Sabbath day comes in front of them. Now, we're going to jump in on verse 3 here, which says, And Jesus answered and spoke to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? A very similar question to what our viewer is posing. Let's go ahead and continue with verse 4. But they kept silent, and he took hold of him and healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, Which one of you shall have a son or an ox fall into a well and will not immediately pull him out on a Sabbath day? And the Bible tells us they didn't have an answer 
for him. So here we find that Jesus is working through the same question with leaders, religious leaders who are wondering, hey, are you, are, is it okay for you to do this? And he ends up with this idea, when someone is in need on the Sabbath, it is important to help them. It is good to do good on the Sabbath, he would say elsewhere. So Jesus healed on the Sabbath. Uh, he was engaging in that labor. It is good to help people on the Sabbath. And so I want to leave with that idea. Now, as to some people wonder, well, what should I do with, uh, with the funds maybe that come from working on the Sabbath? I think that's between you and God, but for to actually help individuals on Sabbath and show up for people who need help, yes, that's right in the footsteps of what Jesus himself would do. Thank you so much, Pastor Flores, for answering that and for bringing in the stories as well um, that Jesus himself healed individuals and other people as well. Uh, I do want to pass the question again to Dr. Daly. Are there other insights that um, you would like to add and maybe something new that we can learn as well? I think the question is born out of a bigger question. How do we keep the Sabbath holy? You know, the, the commandment said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And how do we keep the Sabbath holy? And I think the answer to that lies in just following the, the example of Jesus. In Matthew 12, verse 9, we see what some of the things Jesus did. You know, he would go to the synagogue. He would worship. He would teach. We see that in Mark 1, 21. And we, start, we also see in, in, in the book of Matthew where Jesus did some healing on the Sabbath and that question about whether it was lawful arose. And in M Matthew chapter 12, verse 12, Jesus says it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. So how do we, how do we keep the Sabbath holy? We follow the example of Jesus who said it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Therefore, I conclude that we, doing good on the Sabbath and helping others in a nursing home is lawful. And we can see that as an act of worship. However, you know, as intimated by Pastor Flores, my question is, is working the same as serving? Is working the same as helping? Am I not getting something out of it for myself? Would I go if I was not getting paid? Would the spirit of Sabbath be better upheld if those who served in helping professions did not collect their wages for work done on the Sabbath? Would that not be more? And I'm not saying it should be. I'm saying, is that something we need to consider when we're thinking about what is fitting for the spirit of Sabbath? What is fitting, what is fitting for keeping the Sabbath holy? If we're not to do any work, would it be more fitting for us in helping professions not to collect pay for work done on Sabbath? Just food for thought. Mm -hmm. That is definitely food for thought. And I believe, um, I really liked what Pastor Flores had mentioned earlier, saying that the Holy Spirit, it needs to be a communication between us and um, Jesus on a daily basis as well. So letting the Holy Spirit work in each of our lives as well um, to guide us into making those decisions. But thank you both for um, answering our question. All right, Crystal, what's our next question? Our next question comes to us via text. And the question is, why do you state that the Holy Trinity is three persons. Isn't that adding to the Bible, which we are not to do? Dr. Daly, interesting question here. We know this question comes up a lot. What does the Bible have to say? Any points that we can get out from the Bible here? Thank you, Crystal. That's an interesting question. That's an important question. That's a question that's been asked for centuries. And that's a question that has caused much division in the church over the history of the church. But it is true that the Bible, we're, we're admonished not to add anything to God's word. For example, in Deuteronomy 12, verse 32, we're told, Whatever I command you, be careful to observe it. You shall not add to it, nor take away from it. And Proverbs chapter 30, verses 5 and 6 says, Every word of God is pure. He's a shield to those who put their trust in Him. Do not add to His words, lest He rebuke you, and you be found a liar. And it is true that the word Trinity is not found in the Bible, but we can see the concept of a pluralism to God is very present in the Bible and very pervasive. For example, the Bible tells us, although the Bible tells us in Genesis 1-1 that God, singular, created the heavens and the earth, in Genesis 1-26 we're told that God said, let us make man in our image and according to our likeness. So if God is singular, who 
are us and are. It suggests that God, the singular God, is indeed greater than one. Although in that famous passage in Deuteronomy 6 verse 4, we read, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. So we again we see singular. And in the New Testament, for example, in 1 John 4, we, we read of God with a singular verb. God is love. So how do we reconcile what sounds like this ontological, this is singular for God, but re- where he refers to himself in the plural? The Trinity, the word Trinity, of course, is three, and it refers to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we see that threesome, that Trinity, referred to, for example, in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, where it, where it says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Making reference to a trinity, making reference to God as a trinity, is not adding to the Bible, but it's, it's a way of formulating the Godhead, what we refer to the Godhead, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the three some, the three persons, and one God. It's not adding to it, but it's a way of formulating, a w- formulating it, a way of understanding how God in his fullness as Father, as Son, as Holy Spirit, how he demonstrates his love towards us. Each one of them is God. The Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. Uncreated, underived, but each assumes a functional responsibility for my salvation and for the salvation of the world. So we're not adding, it's just a way of understanding the power and the fullness of God as he works for, on behalf of humanity. Well, thank you so much for that, Dr. Daly, for providing these extra verses as well that we can go back to look at as references. Thank you, Dr. Daly, um, Pastor Flores, for being here and tackling these questions, and we hope to see you again soon. And also, we want to thank our viewers for being here with us today. We hope that you have been blessed as equally as we have been, and we hope to see you again next week. Bye.